Okay, in this tutorial, I'm going to discuss with you how to approach writing up your findings. And in order to do this, you're going to have to watch this video. Uh, I recommend that you have a, a, some paper and a pen to make some notes as I discuss uh, key decisions that you're going to have to make in regards to your findings, as well as opening this document here, How to Write Your Project, which has got the, the main material that will uh, guide you through this process. So once you've opened this document, you want to scroll down to the section on the findings. And I just want to draw your attention at this point at the start of today's tutorial into something that's really important about your findings. So the entire project is worth 60 marks and your findings is divided up into 10 marks that you get for uh, presenting your data using a range of techniques. Uh, so that's this first section that I'm going to discuss in the first half of today's tutorial. But when we scroll further down through it, we get to the second part of what your findings is going to encompass, which is this section, which is where you analyze your results and data. And that's worth 12 marks. So those two sections combined are worth 22 of the 60 marks. So more than a third of your marks come from doing uh, this and doing this well. So this is a step that you want to spend a lot of time on, um, be very careful with in terms of your approach. Uh, and possibly make some notes around the uh, advice I give you about what, what is a good set of findings um, and try to mirror this as much as possible. The other thing I would also do is, if I just jump to the main classroom for a section for a second, have a look at sample projects, um, which I've put up there, and have a look at how lots of other students have approached their findings. There's lots of different ways you can present it, but you'll notice common themes and patterns that the way these different students approach the, the write-up of their findings. Okay, let's get started. So what's the, the kind of the, the first most important things to do? Well, you're going to start by writing the title findings, and you're then going to structure it into your three research questions. And I so you'll have a subheading research question one, research question two, and research question three. And after you put the subheading, you know, research question one, if that's the where you want to start, then you're probably going to want to reiterate what the actual research question is. So remind me, the reader, what is your research question? What are you aiming to, to answer? Uh, and what, what's the, this section of your findings going to be about? Okay. You might even want a, a very short paragraph, something of this kind of length. That's just reminding me, the reader, of, of kind of the key uh, purpose of this particular research question. And remember, a research question should always reflect back on your main aim. So your aim sets the, the goal of the whole project. Your research question gives you a, a real focus area of that. So you might want to refer back to the aim as well. Now, one thing I should point out is you don't need to start in the order of research question one research question two and research question three, you might actually not have all of your data for one of your research questions yet. Uh, so you might want to ch start with uh, number two or number three, but I would lay them out in your project in the order that you established them earlier on when you were writing up your research questions and your background research, because you want everything to tie in and make sense to the reader and be set out in the same way that you've established it earlier on in your project. Right. Now, my, my top tips are you want to show a range of techniques. And what I mean by that is data presentation techniques. Now, I'm going to show you a few using um, this document. Uh, but in class, you'll have learned about a whole range of techniques. And if I just show you where you might want to go looking to see if you can find a technique that you quite like, if you go to the, the GMT section here um, and go to the, the main student workbook, which is this one here, um, that contains uh, massive details on every single technique, most of which you'll have come across in lessons and possibly even practiced uh, creating. And you're going to want to use some of them to present your data. Uh, and it's quite important that your the techniques you choose are not um, simple techniques like bar graphs and line graphs. You want to be actually applying complex techniques, things like kite graphs, dispersion graphs, polar graphs, or radial graphs. Um, you want to be using complex mapping techniques like proportional symbols maps, isoline maps, choropleth, or shading density maps, or dot maps even, flow maps. And, and you want to be using 
and this is a, a real strong top tip, you want to be using at least one statistical technique in one of your research questions, which establishes a null hypothesis, and, and then you, you, you complete the technique. Now that might be, or and is most likely to be a, a chi-square test, a Spearman rank, or a Pearson's, but it might be, depending on your project, uh, one of the other statistical techniques, like standard deviation, um, interquartile range, or even nearest neighbor analysis. Right. Once you've kind of got an idea, and some of them are more obvious, uh, you're going to have to think about how is your data gathered. So is your project uh, uh, where you gather data across an area from a range of sites? Because if it has, then it's very likely you're going to be looking at mapping techniques as one of your main go-to techniques for processing your data. Uh, if your data has been gathered on a transect along a line, it's much more likely that uh, you're looking at change. So you're going to be looking at gr more graphical techniques. But that doesn't mean you can't be thinking about mapping your data as well, because it's perfectly possible to be mapping your data, even if it's just gathered along a line. You might be comparing two different locations. Now, that can allow both uh, uh, graphical and cartographical techniques. So the, the techniques you choose will be very much dictated by the type of data you've got um, and where you gathered it. And of course, a, a good technique, and if we look at the mark scheme, this is kind of important. Um, to get the eight to 10 marks, you've got to have a wide range of valid techniques. What, now, what that means is rather than just at least three, I would be looking across your three research questions to be seeing probably five different techniques. And for those techniques to be complex, but also valid. So you're not just trying to do a technique because it looks good, but actually it's not appropriate for your data. Um, and that will become more apparent. Uh, you know, sometimes the best technique is it is a line graph if you're trying to show change. But if, if a line graph is appropriate for your data or a pie chart, and that would be a simple technique as well, then why not geolocate it on a map, um, an ordnance survey map or, or a Google Earth um, screen grab? Uh, and, and once what you're doing straight away is you're heightening the level of your data presentation because your graph is now uh, on a map pointing to where the data comes from. And if you then had a photograph for one of the bits of data also on that map, so I could visually see where the, the data came from, I could see a graph that shows the data and then I can locate it on a map. Well, that would be taking a simple technique and really enhancing it. So that would come under the second category, skillfully integrating your techniques together, so bringing them together. Now, one of the other things you're going to do, and I'll get to this when I get to the analysis section, uh, the 12 mark section, is that you're going to want to not just analyze each graph and map um, that you that you present in your project, but you're going to actually want to re, um, refer to them uh, the, sort of when you've presented something on a map and maybe later on you're then discussing another piece of data presentation, which has got a link to a piece of data presentation you've already done, you're going to want to make the connections. So what I can see in one graph can relate to maybe what I'm showing in a map somewhere else that I've presented. And I'll talk more about that um, in the analysis section. And you can see quite simply, what's the difference in the marks here? Well, if I if you've got a reasonable range of kind of what we might call mid to low level techniques, pie charts, bar graphs, line graphs, and maybe one or two complex techniques, well, you'll be hitting this level, okay? But if you're going with the more complex technique and you're skillfully integrating them into your project, um, then you're going to hit this top. And I will be asking you all to have a meeting with me, one-to-one -one meeting uh, or online. Uh, in order to explore what the best techniques for your data. Right, let's now just talk about what, because I've talked very general terms and I'm not necessarily giving you an idea, but what, what are the kind of the, what, what would be a good piece of data presentation? Well, I think every good geography project, I'll come back to this by the way, should have um, a complex graph. So here, for example, we have got a dispersion graph for two locations. So imagine you're doing a, a project that's comparing two places. In this case, it was two rivers. It doesn't matter what your data is. You're looking at a range of sites where you've gathered data in each of your locations, and you're looking at the spread of your data set around, uh, in this case, the median value. Because a box and whisker has been added. And to do that, the person's had to calculate the interquartile range of the upper and the lower quartiles. And then they've added the box 
and there's the median right in the middle, and then there's the whisker, that's the range. And we can see that this river here has a much smaller range in depths than this river here. Now, it doesn't have to be a river, it could be anything, uh, but in this case, you'd be using a dispersion graph to compare two locations. That is not just a dispersion graph, though, it's a box and whisker, so there's two techniques combined. It's appropriate because they're trying to show that the depths uh, in the lead knock had a much greater range from shallow deep, and that the this river here was much more clustered. That was the context why they chose it. So they would have been straight away, this technique would be pushing them into the eight to 10 mark bracket. And as long as they repeated similar processing techniques a couple more times, they would be easily scoring the, the, the top level marks just for the data presentation. Okay, so you're gonna want at least one of these sorts of techniques. So this is a, a mapping technique. In this case, um, they've mis they've inappropriately called it a choropleth map because it's not a choropleth map. Um, uh, that would should, uh, choropleth map is a shading density map. So and you can see they've got different colors. This is actually really just a proportional symbols map, but also it's color coded to show the different land uses, as well as the speed of the river. So the size of the circle relates to the speed of the river passing through the different landscapes. Um, so it's a good technique. It's 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 been put onto a uh, Google Earth screenshot because that then helps me visualize the different land uses in the surrounding landscape. So it was appropriate from that point of view. It could have been an ordnance survey map. Um, and it's two different techniques. There's a proportional symbol as well as a color coding technique. So it's, it's high level and it's a complex technique. Uh, a very simple technique, and I would expect to see this littered through your findings. Whenever you've got sites um, that you want to talk about in your results, because maybe they are the lowest result or the highest result out of all your results, or they show something that's very different from the general pattern that you're observing on a graph or in a map, then you're going to want a photograph of that location, and you're going to want to annotate it like the person's done here. Uh, and that should always be done specifically when um, you've got a result that's specifically different from all the others. It's not just a question of having a photo for any result. In this case, the, the author has chosen a specific photograph because this location was showing something different from all the other locations. Okay. Um, finally, you're going to want some kind of statistical test at least once. So in this case, the, uh, the person's looking at um, variations on a slope in soil. So they're comparing two variables. They're lo looking at uh, distance on a transect, and then they're looking at the second variable, soil depth, humidity, uh, and they're doing a scatter graph first to establish what kind of relationship there is. And then they're doing a Pearson statistical test to see if it's statistically significant, uh, the two things that they're looking for. Now that might be appropriate for your project uh, if you've got data that's got an X and a Y variable and you want to see if there's a correlation. Chi-square, you might want to, if you've got categorized data and you want to see if there's a difference between two locations, for example, or two categories. And, and it's, it's always possible to find a statistical technique somewhere amongst your three research questions. Some of you will have projects that very much lend to doing a lot of statistical technique and, and doing it for every research question. And some of you will have to, will have to think carefully about what's appropriate for your data. Okay. Right, so that's the guidelines. You are going to want uh, a graphs, you're going to want maps, you're going to want statistics, and you're going to want photographs. Now, before I look at the second part, let's just establish some other sort of presentation, key presentation things when you're thinking about your data presentation. So um, always aiming for sophisticated techniques. Combining graphs and maps and pictures all together into one piece of data presentation, even if it's really large and it covers two pages, or maybe you have to turn your page into an A3, so have it as a separate page, A3 size. It's very effective and it will always achieve you a higher level of mark by com combining, okay? Take pride in your presentation. If you want to hand draw it and then scan it or photograph it and put it into your project, that's completely appropriate. It doesn't have to be done digitally. If you can't figure out a way to do it digitally and prefer to do it by hand, then I would thoroughly recommend doing it by hand. Don't make it too small. So I can't actually see what you're present, what you're trying to present. Uh, make sure that the person looking at your project can see what you're presenting. Make sure every piece of data presentation has a title. Call it figure something. Okay, so it should be figure 10.1 or figure six or figure seven. And of course, you will be referring to every single piece of data presentation in your analysis. 
Um, so you'll have to name it. So you, for example, when you're writing about it, you'll say as figure 10.2 shows, and then you would obviously tell me what it shows. So that's the way you refer to your data presentation. If it's a map, make sure there's a scale and a compass on your map. All maps should have scale and compasses. If you've got a graph with an axis, make sure all your axes are labeled as well as your graph having a title. And all pictures should have some degree of annotation, not just labeling, but should have annotation that shows that you're interpreting the photograph. Okay. Right. We're going to, I'm just going to be talking about these things um, in the next section because uh, these three bullet points in the analysis section, because that's where you're going to um, score your highest proportion of marks. So what I would do is you might need to pause this at various points and played it back. Uh, and, and I would at this stage pause the, the, the video because I'm going to now explore the data analysis section. Um, and you might actually want to start thinking about doing some data presentation before paying attention to the data analysis section.